didn't shoot. Okay, so again, base Reeves, Bad News for Outlaws. We're reading this biography. Our work today is in our notebooks. We're going to be paying attention to what did base Reeves do that made him so remarkable? Why do we remember him years and years and years after he died? Um, and in your notebook, so you're gonna be writing down what he achieved or accomplished, what made him famous, but you're also gonna be thinking about what was it about him as a person? What character traits um, did he have that made him able to do what he did? And what evidence in the story is there of those character traits? You can also be doodling if you want a little bit, just because it's a long story. Yes, Song, you had a question? I have a question. Like, why do they, um, do they put the death of a person, like, at the day instead of... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Say it again, louder. Uh-oh, did Zong get kicked out? I can't hear you, sorry, Zong. Okay. Bad News for Outlaws, The Remarkable Life of Base Reeves, Deputy U.S. Marshal by Vanda Michelle Nelson, illustrated by Gregory Christie. Um, I like this book, too, because I think we often study African-American history in Black History Month, and we study the same, like, four or five people. But the truth is, there were hundreds and hundreds of outstanding African-Americans in history, and their stories are not often told. So since we're studying Oregon history and kind of the Wild West and all of that, I thought this would be a good time to learn about this gentleman. Showdown, Indian Territory, 1884. So the Oregon Trail was in the 1840s, 50s. By um, 1860, it was kind of shutting down. The railroad had been built. And then people came west and started settling it. But frankly, there was not very much rule of law. It was pretty crazy. Jim Webb's luck was running muddy when Base Reeves rode into town. And I have to warn you, this book is not, um, it's not fiction. And so it has some true things in it about him killing people, just so you know. He was a, a police officer and he had to do that. Webb had stayed one jump ahead of the lawman for two years and he wasn't about to be caught now. Packing both his rifle and his revolver, the desperado leapt out a window of a store. He made a break for his horse, but Reeves had cut him off. Base hollered from the saddle of his stallion, warning Webb to give up. The outlaw bolted, which means he ran. Base shook his head. He hated bloodshed, but Webb might need killing. As a deputy U.S. Marshal, it was Base's job to bring Webb in, alive or dead. Base had put Webb behind bars before, but the outlaw was back on the run. That would end today. Webb could run fast, but he couldn't outrun a horse. He knew he'd hang for sure this time if he got caught. In a last ditch effort to escape, he stopped, turned, and got out his rifle. Webb first shot grazed Bass's saddle horn, so it actually got Bass's saddle horn. His second shot cut a button from the lawman's coat. His third tore the reins right out of Bass's hand. Bass ducked his head, dove off his horse, and rolled to his feet just as a fourth bullet clipped his hat brim. That was Jim Webb's last shot ever. Marshal Reeves fired two rounds from his Winchester rifle and the outlaw was done for. As he lay dying, Webb told Bass, you are a brave, brave man. I have killed 11 men and I expected you to be the 12th. Webb gave Bass his revolver out of respect. Bass had his body and turned in his boots as proof that he'd gotten his man. And here he is getting his man. I have a question. Yeah. What is the person's name again? name is ba Bass or Bass, B-A-S-S, -S, Bass Reeves. I guess we'll call him Bass. Being a peace officer in Indian territory was rough and dangerous. The area swarmed with horse thieves, train robbers, cattle thefts, and gunslingers. Bandits, swindlers, and murderers thrived. Travelers sometimes disappeared, never to be heard from again. A law man's career could be short and end bloody. So Bass Reeves had a big job and it suited him right down to the ground. Everything about him was big. Bass stood a head taller than most men of his time. I think this is him maybe down in the hole, I'm not sure. Bass was so strong he single-handedly pulled a steer out of the mud up to its neck while a bunch of slack-jawed cowpokes stood speechless. Bass sported a large bushy mustache and wore a wide brim black hat. He rode a tall, powerful horse. But the biggest thing about Bass Reeves was his character. He had a dedication to duty, 
few men could match. He didn't have a speck of fear in him. And he was as honest as the day is long. And now we're going back in time to the 1840s. So this is right when the Oregon Trail was going on and the Civil War, 1840s to 1860s. Bass spent most of his early years as a slave in Texas. Even as a youngster, his sharp star shone bright. Bass was sharp-witted, which means smart, and good-natured. People liked him. He had a special way with animals, especially horses. He tended the livestock and fetched water for the field hands. The field hands would be the slaves who were working, picking the crops and things in the field. Bass sang. He sang about pistols and rifles and knives. He sang of bandits and killers and thieves. His mother feared her boy might go bad. She couldn't have been more wrong. Bass took to guns like a bear to honey, but he always handled them with respect. He grew up smart and decent, had had nothing but right in his heart. His owner, so this is back in slave days, Colonel George Reeves took him hunting and injured him in shooting contests. He liked showing Bass off. Bass impressed his owner so much that he took him with him when he went to fight in the Civil War. But one night something happened that changed everything for Bass. And here's the picture. I think you'll notice the color is gone from this picture. And I think that's maybe the author's way of changing the mood of the story a little bit. Folks say the two men argued during a card game and Bass struck his owner, he hit him. For a slave, this meant certain death. Bass had to run away and made tracks for Indian territory. The next chapter is titled Freedom and Family, late 1860s to 1874. Only Native Americans were supposed to live in Indian territory. So this is before the United States were the United States. We had the 13 original um, colonies and the rest of it was just kind of called Indian territory. So even though Lewis and Clark had already explored and you're gonna learn more about that in a couple of weeks, um, they hadn't really settled that land yet. It was kind of the wild west. Only Native Americans were supposed to live there, but some Indians accepted Black-skinned Americans. Bass lived with the tribes, learned their languages, and perfected his marksmanship. Does anybody know what marksmanship is? Aiming. It means you can shoot at a target and hit your goal. Good. Still, as a runaway slave, Bass had to keep on the dodge. He had to be careful because he could be caught and sent back. Finally, the Civil War ended and the slaves were officially free. It was finally safe for Bass to settle down. He bought some land in Arkansas, just outside Indian Territory, and married a pretty woman named Jenny. True to the song of his life, Bass had a big family. He and his wife had 11 children, and they worked the land and they raised livestock. His life was good, but times were hard for folks in Indian Territory. The vastness or hugeness of this wild country offered countless places for bad men to hide. The territory became a haven for the West's most notorious outlaws. Settlers in Indian territory had had enough. Even though most were squatters who had put down stakes illegally, they wanted protection. So in 1875, the US government sent Judge Isaac C. Parker to bring law to the territory. People called him the hanging judge. Here he is. <laughs> yes, hanging. Look what's behind him there. And the mention of his name made outlaws who'd never spend a day in church whisper a prayer. The judge hired 200 deputy marshals to track down the outlaws in an area covering 74,000 square miles, larger than what would become the entire state of Oklahoma. And Bass Reeves was one of them. He became Judge Parker's most trusted man. Bass was perfect for his job. He knew the territory and its people. He had handy tools for tracking criminals and his skill with shooting was already the talk of the territory. Bass was blazing fast on his draw and as good with his left hand as with his right. So that's called ambidextrous if you can use both hands. Can any of you use both of your hands to write? Do I have any ambidextrous tips? Well, I could, but my left hand looks so sloppy. Well, that's not it, Clara. <laughs> I'm right handed. Yeah, right. only a few people are ambidextrous where they can use both hands. That's, that's let's see. Miss Laws, I'm ambidextrous. Really? Awesome. Yeah. Bass was really fast and he was a good shot and he would always win contests uh, at turkey shoots and picnics and fairs. One 
one sharpshooter said that when Bass stood firm and took careful aim, he could shoot the left hind leg off a flying fly settled on a mule's ear at 100 yards away. <laughs> I think that's kind of a joke. Like most former slaves, Bass could not read or write, but this did not stop him from doing his job. Before going after wanted men, he had the arrest warrants from Judge Parker read to him. He listened carefully and he memorized the shape of the letters for each name he heard. He memorized the charges against each person too. Then he'd hit the trail. Even when he got 30 warrants at one time, he always could memorize all 30 warrants and bring in the right man. Bass could be out hunting for weeks. He slept on the ground under the stars and worked in bitter cold and blazing heat. Like other deputy marshals, Bass traveled with a chuck wagon and a cook and a guard and at least one posse man and a tumbleweed wagon to transport his captives. So if you look in the back, he would put his prisoners in there. Go out on the trail, here's his cooking kitchen. Kind of cool, huh? And then he would have these other people to take care of the prisoners while he went after more people. Many lawmen of the time weren't much better than the hard cases they arrested, but Bass was as right as rain with the boot heels up. He couldn't be bribed, and he shot only as a last resort, even when Judge Parker said, bring them in alive or dead. Some outlaws, like Jim Webb, forced gunplay. Whenever Bass could, he found another way. Bass took many a bad man by surprise through the use of his disguises. One day he'd pose as a cowboy. Another he'd dress up as a tramp, a gunslinger, or an outlaw. Even horses played a part in his disguises. Like many US Marshals, Bass rode some of the finest horses. Most times he rode a handsome sorrel, they call the color of this horse. I don't even know what that is, but maybe one of you does. Bass rode proud in the saddle. There was no mistaking his silhouette but prize horses could be a dead giveaway that the rider was a lawman. Bass always kept some rough looking horses and rode lazy when undercover. So he would change horses so it didn't look like he had too fancy of a horse. He planned every capture carefully. When he heard about two outlaw brothers who were hiding in their mother's cabin, he rounded up a posse and made camp some distance away. Then he knocked the heels from a pair of worn boots and shot three holes in his floppy old hat. He hid his badge, cufflinks, or not cufflinks, handcuffs and pistols under his old clothes and started walking to the hideout. It was a long walk, 28 miles in broken boots. He wanted to be sure that if anybody saw him, they would not suspect that he was the law. When the mother answered the door, he said he was tired and hungry. Showing the woman the bullet holes in his hat, he claimed a posse was after him. She took him in, fed him some food, and even let him know that her boys were being looked for by the law. When the two arrived, they agreed to partner up with him and they shared some laughs and they all went to sleep. But in the morning, when the boys woke up, they were in handcuffs. He slipped them into handcuffs in the night. As he led her sons away, the mother followed him for three miles, calling him every bad name she could think of. <laughs> so he was a clever uh, lawman. On a different warrant, he pretended to be a farmer. He rented some skinny oxen and a rundown wagon. He drove the bad looking rig to the hideout of the men he was tracking. He ran over a stump and got his wheel caught. The outlaws came out to help. They wanted to get him away from their hideout. Just as the criminals freed up the wagon, he jerked out his guns. Seeing him that he was a US Marshal, all four outlaws just threw their hands in the air and let him arrest them. He brought in wagon loads of criminals, as many as 17 prisoners at one time. Wow, hmm, crazy. Being a church going man, he reckoned he could do more than put bad men behind bars. In the evenings after he ate dinner, he would go talk to the outlaws about the Bible and about living a good life. Getting through to them was like trying to find hair on a frog, but Bass kept trying. Now and then, captured outlaws tried to trick him, but he was tough. One day while he napped, a skunk came into camp and stopped next to him. Captives chained to the tumbleweed threw stones at the skunk, hoping it would spray him. But when Bass awakened, he didn't even move. He reached out and gently petted the skunk. <laughs> Here he is with his skunk. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, guys, Zanya need to mute. Word spread that Bass was a square shooter, but a hard man. Outlaws learned that when Marshall Reeves had your warrant, you were as good as got unless you hightailed it out of the territory. One outlaw was named Hellaby Sammy, and he did just that. He ran off, but Bass was on his heels. He mounted a swift black horse that flat out ran the Marshall's horse, but Bass was patient. He would cross paths with Sammy on another day and get his man. So he did catch him later on. Even the infamous bandit queen, her name was Belle Star. There she is, the bandit queen, admired Bass. Belle was about as far from tender as boot leather. She trifled with the likes of Jesse James, who was a notorious outlaw, and didn't cotton to lawmen. But when she heard Bass had her warrant, she turned herself in for the first and only time in her long lawless career. Bass was respected and he was hated. Some whites in the area didn't like the idea of a black man with a badge. Desperados simply wanted him off their trail. Bass had to be on the lookout day and night for bad men who were hiding out and were dangerous to him. Duty was his guide, right and wrong were clear and simple. One day on the prairie, Bass came across an angry mob. Hmm. Without a word, he, uh, oh, let's see, an angry mob who was hanging a man. Believe it or not, back in those days, if, if the town didn't like somebody, they would just go hang them without having a trial. Bass cut the man down and put him on the back of his horse. This was nearly as risky as a grasshopper landing on an anthill, but the mob just watched in awe as he rode off. They recognized him and dared not interfere. We're near the end now. His devotion to duty was legendary. His sense of justice was never more tested than with his son, Benjamin. One awful day, Benjamin killed his own wife after she had been untrue. Bass was so well liked that no one wanted to arrest his son. For two days, the warrant lay on his desk. When Bass returned to the jail with prisoners, he got the sad news. It was painful, but he did what only Bass Reeves would do. He arrested his own son and turned him over to the court. Although he was sentenced to life, Bass's son was a model prisoner and was pardoned after serving 10 years. Oklahoma statehood. In 1907, and you might have seen, a, um, there's a musical called Oklahoma, and it's about statehood in Oklahoma when they became a state. November 16th, 1907, Bass Reeves' life as a deputy U.S. Marshal ended the day Oklahoma became a state and Indian, Indian territory ceased to exist. State and local lawmen took over the federal marshal's duties. Bass Reeves served as deputy U.S. Marshal in Indian territory for 32 years longer than any other man. In fact, he was the only deputy who started with Judge Parker and stayed clear through statehood. He arrested more than 3,000 men and women, blacks, whites, and Indians. Many were desperate outlaws who knew Bass rode for Parker and figured they had nothing to lose by fighting to the death. Bass had many close calls, but was never wounded. Remarkably, he only killed 14 men in the line of duty. Now the finest deputy U.S. Marshal of his time was out of a job. He was pretty upset about getting put out to pasture. He hired on with a police force in Muskegee, Muskegee, Oklahoma. Bass was nearly 70 years old and was walking with a cane, but he still put the fear of God into lawbreakers. During his two years on the force, not a single crime occurred in his patrol area. One fall day, Bass Reeves left work feeling ill. Two months later, he died of a kidney ailment called Bright's disease. Hundreds of people, Blacks, Whites, and Indians, attended his burial. A fellow lawman, Bud Ledbetter, called Bass one of the bravest men this country has ever known. And one white homesteader said Bass was the most feared deputy U.S. Marshal that was ever heard of. Here's his real photo with his big, big mustache. That's a big mustache. Yeah. Over the years, the name Bass Reed faded, like one of those heroes they call unsung. But his story has folks talking again, talking about the big man who helped bring peace to a big country, Deputy U.S. Marshal Bass Reeves, a true champion of the American West. And in the back they have, um, because right now we're reading uh, nonfiction, I want to show you some of the text features. This one has Western words, so some of the funny words they used. 
um, are in there. A timeline, which is a cool feature that some books have, especially if they're about history. It's got further reading and websites that you can check out, which is cool. It's got more about Judge Parker, more about the Indian Territory, and then it tells right here, it tells the research. So remember when I had you guys uh, make a list of where you got your information? By next year, you're gonna be having to include this whenever you do a research report, something called a bibliography, which is a list of where you did all of your research. And it's kind of what, like a way of saying to your um, readers, hey, you need to listen to me because I've done a really careful job of researching this. And then it has an author's note about where the author heard this story and why they wrote the book, which is pretty cool. Bass Reeves. So does anybody wanna share any of the um, things that you think Bass got famous for or character traits you think he had? Uh, Emma, M, go ahead. Um, I just wrote down things that I thought were interesting. Okay. What do you think was uh, important that you wrote down? One of the things that I think was important is he is famous for good and he did, he killed and arrested for good. Good. Uh, Clara. Um, the character traits I came up with were really determined because like even when he was like 72 years old, he was like still trying to work for it. Good. Yeah. And then also fearless because like he, going after bandits is definitely not something an ordinary person would be doing. And then he's also very smart, like you said, with the disguises and stuff like that. Yeah, and I think he got famous for like, um, like uh, protecting the area and like putting fear into people who for being mean and still trying to like not hurt them and still trying to give them like a second chance. Excellent. So we are going to stop today because we've been on here quite a while and it's 945 and I want to move on with our meeting. But um, anytime you read a biography, remember that you need to ask yourself, is this person famous for a good thing or for a disaster? If it's a good thing, you want to pay attention to the character traits that enabled the person to become who they were and what they got famous for. And hopefully from now on, you'll remember the name Bass Reeves. And if anybody asks you about a famous African-American hero, you might bring that name up. And I bet that most grown-ups don't know that name. So that's kind of cool. Um, so that's it for.